One of the brightest stars in the sky is called Canopus. Canopus is the second brightest star after Sirius and has been one of the most important celestial bodies in many ancient cultures. The light from Canopus tells us the story of the final evolutionary stages of medium mass stars, on the borderline between those that die peacefully like the sun and those that explode violently as supernova. Get ready because today we are talking about Canopus, one of the most interesting and fascinating stars in the southern sky. Arrakis, the planet from Frank Herbert's novel Dune, orbits around Canopus. It would be the third planet in this system, at a distance of about 87 million kilometers from its star. This distance seems large, but it's actually just over half the distance between Earth and the Sun. A rather unfortunate choice by Herbert, considering that at such a distance from such a bright star, no form of life could ever exist on this planet. In short, Arrakis would be a decidedly sterile planet. Follow me for a moment. With a magnitude of 0.7, Canopus is the second brightest star in the sky after Sirius, so bright that in the past, there was sometimes confusion over which was brighter between Sirius and Canopus. However, there is a significant difference in the brightness of these two stars. Noticing that it is not particularly bright by itself, the fact that it appears so bright in the sky is due to its great proximity because Sirius is just eight light years away from us and is therefore one of the closest stars to Earth. Regarding Canopus, this is not true. In fact, Canopus is about 300 light years away, which is 37 times farther than Sirius. If it appears so bright that there is confusion between these two stars, it means that Canopus is really very, very bright by itself. In fact, this star shines with a brightness that is about 10,000 times that of the Sun. To receive the same amount of energy that Earth receives from the Sun, a planet orbiting Canopus would have to be about three times the distance of Pluto from the Sun, which is about 110 astronomical units. So this is why at only half an astronomical unit, Arrakis in science fiction would not only be a desert, but it would also be completely uninhabitable. I'm sorry, Herbert. Canopus is an easy star to find in the sky because first of all, it is very bright, but also because we can use other well-known and bright stars to locate it. In fact, it's enough to start from the so-called winter triangle made up of Sirius, Procyon, and Betelgeuse. Trace the triangle and use it as if it were an arrow with its tip at Sirius. Following it, we will reach Canopus. It's hard to go wrong given the great brightness of these stars compared to any other star in their vicinity. There is a problem, though, for European observers. The Winter Triangle is never very high on the horizon. In fact, Canopus is not visible at European latitudes because it is always below the horizon. Canopus can only be seen below 37 degree latitude, which means that, at best, it can be seen far south in Europe. To see Canopus properly, one needs to move much further south, at least into the Sahara. Going back in time, the situation must have been even worse. Due to the precession of the equinoxes, there was even a period at the end of the Pleistocene, about 12,000 years ago, when Canopus served as the pole star for the Southern Hemisphere. There was, in fact, a rare period of time when there were two bright stars at both celestial poles. About 12,000 years ago, this star was near the South Celestial Pole while the equally bright Vega was near the North Pole. This same period will return in about 14,000 years, as the precession of the equinoxes has a cycle of about 26,000 years. In any case, at least until 2003,000 BC, Canopus remained well visible from low latitudes above the equator, and this is why, with its great brightness, it was a very important star in various cultures that had access to this portion of the sky. The Babylonians, for example, the first to give us written sources about sky observations in general, knew Canopus very well. They called it Mulnun, which means Star of Eridu, which was the southernmost Sumerian city. Not coincidentally, in India, Canopus was called Agastya, and its heliacal rising was highly regarded. We have already seen this for Sirius in reference to Egyptian culture. The heliacal rising is the first moment of the year when a star rises in the east, just before disappearing at dawn. In the texts of ancient Indian astronomy, the importance of Canopus's heliacal rising from a religious point of view is mentioned. This star was not visible in the skies of the Greeks or Romans, but it was visible in ancient Egypt and the Arab world. It was from Alexandria in Egypt that one of the greatest astronomers of antiquity, Ptolemy, saw it. It was Ptolemy who named it. In the Almagest, he called it Canobos, from which Canopus is derived. Canopus was the name of the mythological navigator who led the ship of the king of Sparta, Menelaus. In fact, Canopus was also the head of a ship in the sky. Today we call it Alpha Carinae, 
the brightest star in the constellation Carina, but it was once called Alpha Argus, the brightest star in the constellation of the ship Argo. The ship Argo was one of the 48 constellations described by Ptolemy depicting the ship of Jason and the Argonauts in mythology. It was a gigantic constellation made up of at least 160 stars easily visible to the naked eye. But if you look at a list of constellations today, you won't find this one anywhere. Being excessively large, in the 18th century, the French astronomer Nicolas Louis de Lacaille divided it into three constellations called Carina, Puppis, and Vila. And these three have remained among the 88 official constellations recognized by the International Astronomical Union. In short, the ship Argo is no more, but its parts remain. The Bedouins of the Negev used Canopus as the southern star, using it together with the North Star to orient themselves. We have done something similar with space probes in much more recent times. Some probes, to orient themselves and calculate their route in space, use Canopus. For example, the Mariner or the Voyager probes had this instrument called the Canopus Star Tracker. It is a star sensor which is a camera that determines the position of the probe in space using some bright stars of known position, like Canopus. But why is Canopus so bright? Such great brightness for this star is obviously due to its mass, its size, but above all to its evolutionary stage. Let's look at it calmly because this tells us what happens in medium mass stars during the final stages of their life. Before continuing, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future content. Because of its inconvenient position, Canopus has always been studied relatively little by Western astronomers. Among the first to study it well was the American astronomer Jesse Greenstein from the McDonald Observatory in Texas. In 1942, he published a study describing the spectral characteristics of this star. The light from Canopus showed a great presence of hydrogen, but also the presence of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and iron. These characteristics placed it in the spectral class FO, a yellow and luminous supergiant star with a surface temperature around 7500 degrees C. Today we actually classify it in the A9 class, which is still the class closest to FO, so it doesn't really change much. It is a rather rare type of star, and this means that it is important to study it because we have few examples of this type of star. And those few we have allow us to add essential pieces to the puzzle of stellar evolution. Therefore, it becomes important to understand its fundamental parameters such as mass, distance, and diameter. Its distance, as I mentioned, is 3 to 10 light years. It was precisely calculated by the Hipparchos satellite between the late 1980s and early 1990s, while it cannot be observed by the more recent Gaia because it is too bright and would therefore saturate the sensors. Canopus is part of the Scorpius Centaurus association of stars, probably all born together, initially bound by gravity but then separated by the proper motions of the individual stars. Canopus emits light mostly at visible and ultraviolet frequencies, but it is one of the few stars that have been observed at many different frequencies across the electromagnetic spectrum. For example, it was observed in the ultraviolet during the Gemini 11 mission. It was one of the manned missions preparing for the Apollo missions, which had to conduct various scientific experiments. One of these included ultraviolet observations of some stars, including Canopus. But this star also emits a lot of X-rays. And this may seem strange because X-rays are very energetic, but Canopus, after all, is not a star that is so hot. It is only slightly hotter than the sun. Probably its X-ray emission has to do with its corona, which must be terribly hot, up to 15 million degrees, 10 times hotter than that of the sun. The corona is heated by the star's magnetic fields until it emits the X-rays that we measure. Canopus is also bright at other frequencies, such as radio waves. Probably it is the electrons accelerated by the magnetic fields in the corona that generate these emissions. Canopus is not a very ancient star, in fact, but it is much more evolved compared to the sun. Its age is about 25 million years. I remind you that the Sun is 4.5 billion years old, so much, much younger. But a star like Canopus has already finished burning hydrogen in its core, unlike the Sun. In fact, the more massive stars are, the faster they go through the so-called main sequence, which is a period where most stars spend most of their lives. In the main sequence, stars burn hydrogen in their core. Once this fuel, hydrogen, is exhausted, they exit the main sequence and enter other phases of their evolution. What this next phase will be depends essentially on the star's mass. They can become giant stars like the sun will become a red giant in 6-7 billion years. Canopus, however, has a mass that is much greater than that of the sun, about 9.5 times. 
a mass that is just above the minimum necessary to explode as a supernova. So, will Canopus explode as a supernova? We are not so sure. Canopus has a mass that is 9.5 times that of the Sun, but we actually know it with a large uncertainty of about one and a half solar masses. This means that the mass of Canopus can be between about 8 solar masses and about 11, which is a big difference, especially considering that the minimum limit to explode as a supernova is about 8 solar masses. So Canopus could be just below or just above this limit. We do not know precisely if it will explode as a supernova or not. In any case, if it becomes a supernova, it is still far from this phase because currently in its core, Canopus is burning helium, which fuses producing carbon. But there is also another big uncertainty regarding the evolutionary stage of Canopus, which affects other parameters such as age, diameter, mass, and so on. We do not know if Canopus is a star that is heating up or a star that is cooling down. It could have recently been, from a stellar point of view, a red giant immediately after finishing hydrogen. That is, it would have been a blue star in the main sequence, then evolved into a red giant cooling down, and then would have started heating up again, becoming the yellow giant we know today. On the other hand, Canopus could be a star that is just now cooling down to become a red giant. It is as if we saw a car in the middle of an intersection and did not know if it is going one way or the other. In short, we do not know in which direction Canopus is moving. We do not know because it is currently in the middle of what is called the Blue Loop. The Blue Loop, a transition phase between red and blue giants, and could therefore be moving in one direction or the other. One day, when and if it explodes as a supernova, only a beautiful nebula with a neutron star in the center might remain of Canopus. Or if its mass is not enough to explode, it could become a white dwarf, one of the most massive white dwarfs in the galaxy, a rare nitrogen-oxygen white dwarf. This object, no longer heated by nuclear reactions, could then cool down forever. Thank you for following us up to here. We invite you to continue following us, subscribing to the channel, and activating the bell to not miss future content.